Welcome to the July monthly community call of the Transmark Foundation. As always, these meetings are recorded and posted and available through the Foundation website for offline viewing. Our uh, agenda for this month will include a, a report on the recent uh, datathon, an update on the Transmart platform, platform versions 1.x and 2.0, an update on the recent board meeting, an update on planning for this fall's annual meeting, results of the user survey, and then an exciting demo from the University of Luxembourg on data visualization and interaction work that they've done, something called SmartR. So we'll get right to it, and I'll turn things over to Keith to uh, uh, lead our Datathon report. Keith? Thanks, Kevin. So we, uh, we finally held our, uh, our inaugural uh, TransMart Foundation Datathon. Uh, a couple of weeks ago now, it was June 30th through July 2nd uh, at the Thomson Reuters offices in the Seaport District in Boston. Uh, it was uh, a lot of work to put together. I've learned that uh, datathons are a lot harder to organize than hackathons. Um, uh, ha developers tend to be a lot more self-sufficient and require less infrastructure. Uh, but uh, the work that the organizing pity committee put in, uh, I think, was really well rewarded, and we had a, a fantastic event. Uh, so just to remind people, this was a collaboration with the Michael J. Fox Foundation, um, working with them on uh, a number of key data sets that have been sponsored by the Fox Foundation, the PPMI, LERC2, and BioFind data sets. Uh, integrated in a Transmart instance with the ADNI data set and the 10 uh, public data sets that were uh, curated and donated by uh, the University of Luxembourg. Um, one of the key issues around the, the datathon was that um, we uh, had originally intended to host the data uh, on a cloud server and, and to work uh, jointly from there. Uh, unfortunately, we're unable to do that uh, due to some of the data use agreement restrictions, uh, which would uh, consider that a, a redistribution of data. So uh, we worked out an arrangement with, uh, with the group at the Laboratory of Neuroimaging at USC, uh, and University of Michigan helped us uh, install uh, Transmart on their servers and load uh, the data from the various different sources into that instance, uh, tune it, optimize it, and, uh, and make it work. Uh, so uh, I want to thank uh, Loney and the University of Michigan team and all the different volunteers that worked on that. It was a, a terrific effort. Uh, also the University of Luxembourg for contributing their data sets and uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation and Thomson Reuters for contributing uh, their data sets. Um, we had 25 scientists. We limited um, our enrollment. We, we were going to limit it to 20, but we had uh, uh, 25 people that uh, insisted on joining, and so we, we, we grew it to 25. Uh, we organized ourselves into five teams uh, uh, to pursue the different challenges, and uh, we had a, a great three days of, of working on things. And in fact, I was uh, incredibly excited about the uh, uh, the energy that was in the in in the space as we worked together on this. It was really a, a very uh, focused and energetic uh, effort. Um, just to remind people, we we had a, a series of awards uh, that we gave out. Uh, we gave the Innovation Award to a, a team uh, called the Blue Men Group. Uh, it turned out that these guys all wore blue shirts on the same day, and so they called themselves the Blue Men Group. Uh, they used a machine learning based uh, technique uh, to identify a set of SNPs that um, were indicative of progression or predictive of progression in Parkinson's disease, which is a really interesting preliminary result. Uh, the Biomarker Awards went to uh, Team Venetus and the Team E, which is the Biomarksman, uh, which both use some very interesting informatics approaches to identify cross-disease biomarkers. In one case, uh, exporting data into MATLAB for some significant analysis, and the other case, exporting data into uh, Metacore uh, for some downstream analysis. Uh, the research award went to a group uh, called uh, PDADY, or PDADY, and the notorious LARG, which is one of the key biomarker genes that they identified. Um, looking again across, uh, across various aspects and developing some very interesting new methods for analysis. And then finally, the, the Best Presentation Award went to uh, Team Biobricks, uh, which did a, a really uh, tour de force in terms of analysis of existing and known biomarkers across the two different disease sets, um, across Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and within the different sets of data sets. Uh, really a very, very good presentation. 
Next slide, Kevin. Uh, just remind people the data fund instance that we put up uh, was in uh, Transmart 1.2.4. Um, it had a series of public uh, uh, gene uh, data sets uh, from GEO that were curated by the University of Luxembourg and a series of private data sets. Uh, those private data sets um, were uh, governed by a series of data use agreements, which was one of the key issues that uh, complicated uh, the development of the data fund. We had to get uh, approvals for access to these data uh, for all the participants, both individually and as a group. And given that there are four data sets governed by these data use agreements, uh, there was a lot of logistics uh, around making that happen. Uh, this really highlights one of the key issues around the availability of data and open data. Um, all of the data sets that were used for the Datathon uh, are uh, advertised by NIH as open data sets. And what open uh, is taken to mean is that uh, the data should be freely available to everyone to use, uh, to republish as they wish without restrictions from copyrights, patents, or other mechanisms of control. Um, one of the key things around open data is to be like open source and open hardware. Um, and that is that uh, we want to make sure that this, these data uh, become very, very useful. Um, I was, in fact, having a, a long conversation with the uh, CTO for the state of Massachusetts on uh, making uh, data available and how to do that in the most effective ways is open data. Uh, but the philosophy behind uh, open data is a, is a long one. Um, uh, the whole idea is to, to make these data available and useful. Next slide. Uh, the reality that we learned in, in this data-thon is that uh, even open data is not really open. Um, the ADNI data set, which is one of the most um, highly uh, uh, recognized uh, open data sets, has within its data use agreement uh, terms such as, I will not further disclose these data beyond the uses outlined in this agreement and my data use application and understand redistribution, redistribution of data in any manner is prohibited. Um, the PPMI uh, data set, again, a very well recognized and, and transformative $100 million plus open data project, uh, states in its agreement, I will not further disclose these data beyond the uses outlined in this agreement, and further goes on to assert, I will do my best to ensure that investigators who utilize uh, these data use appropriate administrative, physical, and technical safeguards to prevent use or disclosure of the data. Um, these are key aspects that uh, I think really challenge us when we're trying to put together things like a, like a datathon, and were some of the really key uh, things that we had to work through uh, from a logistical perspective to pull the datathon off. Uh, but it's not restricted to these data sets. If one looks at the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas uh, data use agreement, um, it says that the requester and approved users agree to retain control over the data and further agree not to distribute the data obtained through this data access request to any entity or individual not covered in their data access request. Uh, we even tried to get around this by putting an agreement in place that had all of our participants on it and saying, well, this is what we're going to use it for and this is what uh, we intend. And uh, in the case of ADNI, uh, that was, was rejected as a potential use. So there's a lot of challenges for us around open data. It's something the foundation is very uh, interested in, in pursuing. And uh, we have the intention of hosting a number of additional data thons. Uh, we want to host one in cancer, and so we're going to take on this data use agreement uh, for the Cancer Genome Atlas as well. Uh, but I just highlight this as a key issue uh, for everyone as we think about uh, how we access and utilize data in the Transmark community. Uh, we did a quick survey of participants in the datathon. I want to give you just a couple of highlights of this. Um, Rudy will put this all together in a, in a better form for us uh, for future uh, use. But um, uh, overall, what we found is that 75% of participants were very satisfied with the datathon. 25% um, were somewhat satisfied and no one was neutral or dissatisfied, which I think was a tremendous success. 82% um, said they would attend another Transmart Datathon, uh, and one respondent said that this was by far the best Datathon that they'd ever attended. This was a, a biostatistician data scientist who routinely attends Datathons and Hackathons and said that uh, it was really the best one that he's been a part of. 92% um, of respondents said they want to continue their work and, and continue to access the Transmart instance. Um, and one of the challenges around this is that um, is that access has been shut down. It was shut down, in fact, uh, a couple of days after the datathon. Uh, that's a challenge that we're currently working on. We asked another couple of key questions. Um, how do people use the Transmart platform? It was really interesting to me to walk around and see the, the really innovative ways that people used it. Um, one of the key ways was as a vehicle to assemble and export to other packages. Uh, we had groups that would select a cohort and a key set of data 
and export that into MATLAB. Um, one did it into machine learning platform. Um, others did it into applications like Spotfire. Um, uh, one key use was as a repository for all the data in a cleaned up and curated form. Um, a number of people used the enclosed analytics. And uh, what I thought was very good is that uh, people used the platform to search and browse and see which data were available and then would export that data to different sets of tools for analysis, including platforms like Galaxy. Um, as I mentioned, 92% um, of people said uh, uh, that they have uh, ac interest in continued ac access to this instance. And uh, the one person that said uh, other, no one said no, uh, was in fact our science writer who was, was covering the event. Uh, so I think it was universal that people found this to be a useful resource and would like continued access to it. And that's something that uh, we will work with the Michael J. Fox Foundation and with the Laboratory of Neuroimaging to find a way to make that happen. Uh, next slide. Uh, a few key comments that came out that I think are very uh, useful for us as we think about our developments in 1.3. Uh, what kind of enhancements would people like? Um, people were really interested in things like the Spotfire and Metacore integrations. Um, they would like to see uh, code samples for the web services access. Um, see additional tools like, like the Galaxy, Spotfire, Disease Maps, um, etc. Uh, that were, were made use of in the, in, in the uh, Datathon. Uh, they'd like improved performance in the API. Um, one, one reviewer said it's, it's usually faster and more efficient if we can use familiar software to generate subsamples. There should be a way to upload the list of subjects, that is a set of subject IDs, into the subgroup panel generated outside of the platform. Uh, so they'd like to be able to take and select cohorts of patients and upload those back into the platform for analysis. Uh, a couple things like PCA, multivariate logistic regression, uh, a link to SAS would be great, and then overall better performance. Next slide. Uh, we talked about what went well. Uh, I think the pre-webinars were, were really useful. Several people called that out. A lot of team interaction, uh, the organization of the event. Um, uh, there were a few initial problems with the Transmart platform that we solved, and I think that was one of the challenges. Um, but everyone, I think, was really universally excited about working with new teams and working collaboratively uh, with groups you never might might see in, uh, in, in the rest of your work, and then to spend three days in an intensive exercise analyzing a set of data in a multidisciplinary team. Next slide. Uh, I think uh, there were some things that we can improve as we go along and do our next datathon. Um, we had some issues with data download, uh, which are clear things that we've uh, uploaded now into JIRA to make sure we address from a bug fixing perspective. Uh, continued access to the data. Um, uh, one of the things that was suggested was to have basically a, a first day conference um, and then two days of working on the, on the uh, event, and I think that's a good suggestion. Um, we will have to work on internet connections and we had some connectivity issues and we think we know how to solve that next time. And uh, I think one of the last ones there I liked was if it's easier for people to export and analyze the data using a familiar software, then it would be much better. And that was a, a key use of the platform that, uh, that I saw that I think is something we need to focus on as we continue to develop the platform, is uh, if we are curating and getting the data in, uh, we have the analytics uh, of Transmart to work with that on as well. But if we can use um, those efforts to select cohorts and select data and export that to other applications, uh, that's a very important function. So that was the datathon. Again, I uh, appreciate uh, the help of the organizing committee, Ken Kubota, Michael J. Fox, um, Kevin and the group at University of Michigan, the Transmart Foundation Fellows, and, and all the participants. It was a, was a great event. Uh, a quick update on uh, further developments as we're going along. Um, we are in the process of, uh, of developing now a version 1.3 of the platform. Uh, this is the roadmap uh, that has been developed. In essence, we're looking at um, having a testing uh, release version of the platform out by the end of the year. It'll be a 1.3 alpha, first quarter a 1.3 beta, and then uh, a production release uh, in second quarter. Next slide. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on uh, focusing on increasing quality and stability. Uh, we have the ongoing bug fixing. We're expecting to have a release end of August of 1.2.5. Uh, we're developing a startup checklist process so that um, when people are installing from source, uh, that it's much easier to do an install and make sure you have all the services running, etc. cetera. Um, we're developing a recommended implementation that is to ensure that um, naive uh, systems administrators, when they're putting this in place, uh, will have a guide to correctly configuring uh, the systems to work most appropriately. 
Uh, we're also working to implement a better production release process. You'll see some of that in 1.2.5 and see this uh, more efficiently integrated with 1.3. Uh, and that includes uh, arch the architecting and implementation of our QA and testing program, uh, a greater involvement of the, of the community, uh, managing the releases through a formal release process um, with uh, signed uh, uh, release artifacts on a mirror site, etc. And then uh, improving the governance of this process uh, through the development of a project management committee. Um, the quality working group has been established. It meets uh, bi-weekly, uh, chaired by Jay Farron of the Transmark Foundation. Uh, members of this group currently uh, are Kevin Smith, Keith Nangle, Terry Weymouth, Peter Rice, uh, and myself. Um, we're recruiting additional members if you want to be part of the architecting of the quality initiative and the quality working group. Um, but the goal here is to come up with and develop the processes and methods for improving quality and stability of the platform uh, through the implementation. And this will be an implementation process that will be over the next uh, six to nine months uh, going on. Uh, we're also implementing our first project management committee. Uh, the, the project management committee uh, will provide governance for the Transmart product itself, but, which includes release management, development and testing, roadmap, etc. Um, this is modeled after the Apache Foundation project management committees and will have uh, very similar roles and responsibilities. Uh, it's chaired by a management team member, that'll initially be me. Uh, and uh, the members that we're recruiting at this point, uh, Yanni Pandis uh, from Imperial and Etrix, Keith Nangle from Transmart, uh, Dave John from Deloitte, Ward Wistra from The Hive, and uh, Sherry Sal from Sanofi. Uh, next slide. Uh, in essence, the Project Management Committee is the governance for uh, all aspects of releasing the platform. And what that states is that uh, each of these members will uh, personally do a testing of the code will personally vote on the release of the code and can individually veto the release of the code if it's not up to the appropriate standards. Um, one of the key aspects of implementing the project management committee is that we'll be implementing some additional governance around uh, the code itself and around the release process to make this more effective. Um, one of the key things that we're doing is learning from other successful open source foundations and Apache in particular has worked out a lot of aspects of uh, software quality, software release, and software governance uh, that we feel can be effective for our community. Uh, next slide. Uh, this leads into uh, the work that we're doing now on version 1.3. Uh, there is uh, a lot of activity uh, starting and ongoing around 1.3 development. Uh, we've been pulling together the requirements for this uh, from across the community. Many of you will have uh, copies of this spreadsheet and uh, I'll have gone through this with you individually. Uh, next slide. Uh, the key goal that we're doing here is to prioritize these features and to identify those people that are developing or sponsoring each of these sets of features. So that process is ongoing. Uh, I'd hope to finish that by the end of last week. I'm still waiting for uh, three uh, contributions to fill this out. Uh, but in essence, uh, we're collecting from uh, both sponsor groups and development groups uh, the priorities uh, and the features that they're developing for 1.3. Uh, and then what we'll generate from that is a gap analysis to see where we need to cover things. Uh, and also, we can identify any redundancy that might be existing so we can be uh, limiting that redundancy. So uh, that's what we're doing in 1.3. If you still owe me materials, please get those to me ASAP, and, and we'll keep working that forward. Uh, we're also working towards uh, the version 2 platform, and, and we had a long discussion uh, at the board uh, about this. But the key thing that we, we recognize is that the, the version one roadmap for us is really uh, an early adopters uh, roadmap. That is, we're working with groups that are um, really interested in accessing new technology. They understand some of the warts and bumps that come along with that uh, and are willing to, <coughs> to live with that. Uh, the challenge for us is, is getting into the majority of end users, the pragmatic end users, et cetera. Everyone who's familiar with Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm understands the challenges of moving from the innovator community to the pragmatist community. Next slide. Uh, our real strategy for this is, is the round version two. That is the work towards having a, a very stable core platform, a uh, fully developed plugin infrastructure, a lot more stability around the code, etc. Uh, we've identified several members of our community that are quite interested in uh, being a key part of that version two development and helping to uh, help us identify the resources uh, to put that in place. Uh, but the goal for us is to have a, a commercial quality core 
uh, a very high quality commercial grade product, scalable uh, as we would in integrate uh, leading edge technology, focus around that plug-in architecture to include the full support for full genomes, which we think is very important for the platform, support for wearable sensors and other kinds of mobile uh, health uh, platforms uh, with a completely redesigned user interface and uh, including a real professional development process, uh, which is, includes uh, full implementation of quality testing uh, and uh, various quality controls. Next slide. Uh, to develop the key initiatives uh, for the foundation going forward, uh, we're focusing on uh, the version 1.3 development and version 2 development programs, but also our work around the fellows program. And that is to fund the fellows program at a full-time level uh, over a three-year period uh, to be, retain that. We're currently funding uh, the part-time fellows, uh, which we have now at Code Community and Content Fellows, um, to support those efforts on a part-time basis out of our operational budgets, but that's not a long-term solution. So we'll be working on fundraising for this as well. Uh, to support this, we are in the process of hiring uh, some part-time business development help, um, which will help coordinate our philanthropic sponsor and grant funding to support these various initiatives. Next slide. Um, let me give you a quick update on the board meeting that was just held on the, the 15th. Um, we reviewed, obviously, the, the current staffing of the foundation. Uh, I think everyone knows uh, who's involved here. Uh, we have the key addition of Keith Nangle, who's our community fellow for Europe, uh, located in Germany, in southern Germany, and uh, is now making key contributions to the foundation overall. Next slide. Uh, we have two new silver members in the last quarter, uh, Thomson Reuters and Rancho Biosciences. And uh, we actually have a, num uh, a large number of additional uh, members in the pipeline. Uh, so you'll be seeing next quarter a, number of, uh, a larger number of new members. Uh, but we're, we're happy to welcome Thomson Reuters and uh, Rancho Biosciences to the silver membership uh, and move that forward. Next slide. Uh, the key strategic issues for us at the board are discussing the development of the 1.3 code base and the development cycle. Uh, we've also identified uh, the, the procurement of project management resources to help in the project management of the 1.3 uh, development process and the implementation of the key quality steps that we're putting in place. Um, we're focusing on the development of a commercial quality and transformational version 2 of the platform, uh, driven by several key members that really feel that that's the platform that they want to adopt on a, uh, an enterprise-wide basis in their uh, organizations. Uh, we're also looking at growing the scope of the foundation, adding additional open source projects to the infrastructure that we have in place, and improving our legal framework. Uh, that is ensuring that the IP around the software projects that we have is uh, clarified, is very clear, and enables people to make most effective use of the, of the software, of the documentation, the videos and training materials, and the content. Um, we presented our business plan and timeline uh, for fiscal 2016. You'll remember that our fiscal year runs uh, July 1st to June 30th. Uh, so we closed up our fiscal uh, 2015 on June 30th and start our fiscal 2016 on July 1st. Our business plan for fiscal 2016 is to uh, complete the production release of 1.3, ensure full funding for that project uh, by working through networks of sponsors and developers, initiate the development of version 2, and begin the funding process for the initial piloting work around version 2. Uh, develop a, a full content strategy and key resources around content and open data. Uh, obtain dedicated funding for the fellows program. And then, uh, very excitingly, extend the reach of the foundation beyond Transmart into additional open source projects. Uh, one of the key things that we see is the foundation has been able to uh, generate significant traction and critical mass, identify some of the key issues around open source development and science, and we feel that where it meets our mission uh, in the uh, area of facilitating translational research, that we will uh, bring additional open source projects on board uh, at the discretion of the board of directors. And to help us fund this and other key activities, uh, we'll be building a business development function. Next slide. Um, I can take you through some of the key objectives for each of the different areas, uh, code, community, and content. I think for the sake of time, I'm going to let those go. Um, so uh, you can see those, um, you know, if you go back and look at those in, in the community objectives. Uh, we also will be investing further in marketing and growing our marketing efforts as we go along. Uh, the key aspects of the budget has been an increase in program-related spending, and uh, we're building that program-related spending to ensure that we uh, continue to invest in the development of key activities around code and community content, and then growing the community and the brand awareness through the, the marketing initiative. 
the other key uh, new spend there is in business development, just to help us uh, generate the resources to do this. In terms of growing the scope of the foundation, uh, we are learning a lot from uh, other successful open source projects, Linux Foundation, Apache Foundation, uh, Mozilla Foundation. Uh, we are building out the legal framework uh, for our open source community to make sure that we have appropriate licenses for software, documentation, content, etc. And uh, we're building out a legal affairs working group headed up by Jamie Katisha, um, who is now helping us uh, make the modifications to our various sets of agreements around software committing. Uh, around copyrights uh, and other IP rights. Uh, we're also uh, looking at expanding the additional projects. Um, one of the key things in adding new open source projects is it requires very little internal infrastructure. We can rely upon uh, not only the administrative functions that we put in place, the legal framework that we put in place, uh, the technical services that we put in place, but um, when it comes to governance, it's really a matter of extending the project management committees to additional projects. So the, uh, the expansion of this is, in fact, adds very little to the cost and operating infrastructure, but it helps us to expand and grow the footprint of the foundation and the footprint of the community. Next slide. So uh, we'll be uh, looking at new open source projects to add to the foundation. We'll be following an Apache-like model uh, in terms of having individual project management committees that are chaired by a member of the management team and report to the board of directors. The incremental cost we estimate to be uh, rather small, 50 to 100K per year per project. Uh, the key advantages of this are to grow our community, uh, increase our critical mass, uh, and push things forward. Uh, potential disadvantages are obviously increased costs and a potential to lose the focus on Transmart. Uh, the management team is very cognizant of this and aware, and we'll be focusing very much on Transmart as the center of our world as we look at other uh, additional projects to, to bring into the fold. Uh, just in terms of updating the governance, this is what you all remember, except for the project management committees. Those project management committees uh, will be chaired by a member of the members of the management team and report directly to the board of directors. And uh, we're developing a set of rules and, uh, and procedures for those project management committees to follow as they manage the governance of individual sets of projects. So uh, that's the quick update on uh, the Datathon, uh, very successful. Uh, what we've done in terms of the 1.3 and 2.0 development, uh, where we're, our board meeting was uh, for our quarter moving forward, and the update of our fiscal 16 budget. So if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Okay, thanks, Keith. Uh, this is Rudy Potenzo uh, from Marketing. I'm going to give you a couple of really quick updates so we are anxious to get on with our presentation from the Luxembourg team. Uh, first is the annual meeting. Uh, before I go, let me just remind everyone that all of these slides and this recording will be up on the website probably later today, hopefully, um, and you can review them there uh, at your leisure. Uh, our third annual meeting is, is set for uh, Amsterdam, hosted by the National Cancer Institute of the Netherlands. Uh, the format will be very similar to what we've had uh, in the past uh, in terms of keynotes, technical sessions, uh, hackathon, uh, and the Datathon report, uh, the 3C committees will be meeting. Uh, we will have a poster session again, uh, and we're working on a training class. Uh, the registration site is now up uh, at transmart.eventbrite.com, and you can start to register. Um, next slide. Um, there are sponsorship opportunities again uh, this year, and we'll be uh, working on that, and you'll be hearing from me as we try to bring this together. Uh, next slide. Um, and uh, we are have our call for presentations and papers. Uh, you can go to the website uh, if you have a presentation or a paper or a poster that you'd like to, to present um, at the meeting. Uh, you can give us a title, an abstract, etc. Uh, a lot more details are coming. The organizing committee is meeting uh, every other week right now, and we'll be meeting every week shortly. Uh, and so certainly uh, keep an eye on the website. We will keep updating that uh, as uh, all the various information comes in. So we hope you'll, you'll plan on joining us. I also want to give you a very brief um, a summary of our user survey. We sent out a, a request for um, information about who's actually using the Transmart system. We got about 92 respondents. And if you look at their responses, uh, this is how they lay out in terms of uh, academic, pharmaceutical, nonprofits, and vendor community. Uh, there's 92 respondents, but if you sort through, there are several had several um, people responding from uh, single organizations. And so, next slide, I, I paired that back to just uh, one per per um, group. 
And you see we've got um, still a very broad set uh, of, of users uh, in, in using the system from different pieces. And if we go one more slide, just in a, in a broad sense, where it's really surprising that it's exactly about a third apiece from the vendor community, the research community, and the academic community. Um, and so we wanted to drill down a little bit to get a little more information about this. And so uh, we asked the question of the types of data uh, that people are using. And uh, again, very encouraging to see that it's a fairly wide uh, variety of types of information people are bringing in, different types of studies that people are, are using the system for. Um, next slide. We're trying to get some feeling of the, um, you know, how, how uh, many different types of servers we have, and, and so this just shows that people are deploying on multiple servers with production environments, test environments, training environments that they're, they're putting together. Next slide. Then the question of the volume of, of information coming into the system, and so uh, there's quite a few studies that people have brought into the system. We asked about how many studies, and uh, per, per group, it's about 17 studies at least per group, but you can see, you know, from people who are just getting started and don't really have much load into the system, all the way to, to a number of groups have over 100 studies already loaded into Transmart uh, in uh, active use. Uh, and again, it's very encouraging to see that, that level of, um, of usage. Next slide. Um, this one maybe is the most exciting here. Uh, this is showing uh, how many users do you have in your organization. Uh, and the blue bars are for this year at this moment, uh, about how many users do you have. And the average uh, across the 68 um, Groups is about 25, 23 users, uh, and you know most of the people are in the you know in that lower end. Uh, and then we asked how many users do you expect next year, uh, and you can see a dramatic shift, uh, a rollout really uh, of significant proportions uh, as folks are starting to to plan and work towards really starting to deploy within their organizations um, the the usage. And I think this really poor, you know highlights a, a very healthy um, a, a, a really strong health of the platform in terms of its increasing uh, usability uh, and interest in, in deploying further. And so, you know, other developments that Keith talked about are, are really critical to continue this, uh, bringing new customers, new, new people to use the, the, the platform is important. But uh, I think this is showing that those who today are using it are really finding it helpful and um, allowing them to start planning for the future. So it's uh, very exciting to see this. And so, uh, and thanking you for, for using, you know, for, for replying to this user survey. This is just one, you know, we'll continue to do this hopefully every six months. Uh, we wanted to give away an iPad, uh, and I'm going to announce the winner in one minute. But um, we used, uh, uh, we wanted to do this rigorously, and so we, we, uh, we found on the web a, a, a tool called Random Picker. It's uh, useful for, certainly for not-for-profits and profit, you know, and it does all of the administration of this, uh, picking, you know, who, the winner is for it, then I loaded in you know, all our information, created our own little survey in this thing, and when I pushed the button, next slide, um, we saw that the winner was selected by the random picker to be Emanuel van der Stuft from Janssen Pharmaceuticals. So congratulations, Emanuel. I'm not sure that you're on the phone today, but I will contact him and make sure that he, uh, he gets his iPad. And again, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, filling out the survey. Uh, hopefully, you find the, the results interesting, and uh, I think this is going to help us as we plan for the, the platform going forward. Okay, so that's that wraps up our the the, pre, the foundations um, presentations for today. Uh, we're very excited to announce to, to to introduce Sasha Herzinger from the the University of Luxembourg, who's going to to talk a little bit and do his demo of, of a smart R. So, Sasha, are you there? Hello. Yes, go ahead. I think you're live. Morning. Actually, I modified my uh, presentation a little bit. Uh, can I show my screen? Okay. Uh, can everyone see it? Uh, yeah, but it's there now. Go ahead. Oh, perfect. No, you're live. Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Sasha. I am from the University of Luxembourg, and um, I'm, I'm, I started to, to, to work on Transmart uh, mid-February, and I'm going to show you a bit of my recent work. 
so what is Smarter? Uh, it's a plugin for Transmart, and it contains several highly interactive and uh, highly interactive visual analytics. Um, the idea is to enable uh, new ways of exploration and interaction within Transmart, and basically playing around with the data. The nice thing about Smarter is I was designing it in a way that everyone who is able to uh, adapt to JavaScript, HTML, and CSS is able to implement own visualizations. So uh, why do we need it? Um, the current limitations of Transmart, uh, quite obviously, you can't post-process your data. That means um, if you do, for example, uh, a scatter plot, you will not be able to compute any correlation on it. You would have to launch a complete new analysis from scratch. Um, you can't explore your data. That means um, when you have a heat map or something like that, you will have to choose a clustering algorithm before actually launching everything. Uh, and you can't change it. And you can't, uh, let's say, pick interesting patients for further analysis. So you can't update your cohorts. Um, how does it work? Um, Actually, its idea is quite simple. You have an input visualization, which is just some uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, you have uh, analysis script. In my case, I'm using R. That's why it's called Smarter. But you can also use Python, Perl, or any other executable. Um, but other than in the different than in the current state of Transmart. These scripts are not here for uh, creating the visualizations. They're here for uh, launching visual, uh, for launching uh, statistical uh, algorithms or sorting my data or stuff like that. And I have an output view, which is probably the most interesting part. Uh, and of course, uh, all of that, um, um, and the output view is actually able to communicate with a, a smarter core and uh, uh, this allows to, to, to um, update certain statistics on the fly, but uh, I think it's better if I'm going to show you because um, I think it's the best way to see what I'm actually talking about. So what you see here is uh, I, was, I was loading the data already during the presentation. It's just uh, some uh, high dimensional data. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you only two of my tools because I think the time will not allow me to show the third one. Um, this is a heat map. So um, as you can see, uh, every point within the heat map uh, has a tooltip now, which uh, which displays the uh, gene symbol, the CETA score, the value, the patient ID, the probe, the gene ID, and the uh, log value. Uh, so what else can you do? Um, you can zoom. As you can see here, nice zooming feature. You can zoom out. Um, well, uh, after that, you can sort your heat maps. So, if you would like to know, for example, for this patient, what is my highest expressed gene, you can sort the whole heat map according to this column. Or you do it by row. You want to know which patient has the highest expressed SP, uh, SPP1 gene. We do it the other way around, etc. As you can see here, it's uh, the heat map is rearranging itself. So, um, of course, not everyone, uh, there is uh, colorblind people, sometimes your values are not uh, divergent, they are sequential. So not ranging from, let's say, minus 100 to plus 100. Maybe they're going from 0 to 1,000. In that case, you want to apply different color schemes. As you can see here, the heat map is updating uh, the colors. So just a feature. Um, so one of the things which was bothering me the most with the heat map was the fact that I actually was only seeing the first, let's say, 50 rows of my heat map. And uh, if I wanted to have more, I would have to relaunch the whole computation. So I added this little button, which I will not click now because it will last a moment and I don't have a lot of time. What this one will basically do, every time you click it, it will append 100 additional rows to that heat map. Uh, which rows? Um, that you can choose here. For the moment, it's uh, 
the most interesting one or the highest ranked one according to variance or standard deviation. But I can also add any other uh, computation here if you would like to. Um, what I'm going to show now is a clustering. For the moment, I was implementing six different clusterings just to cover some. Uh, but it's really easy to add new ones. So what I'm going to add, uh, do now is, let's say, um, hierarchical Euclidean average. As you can see here, the heat map is clustering on the fly. It's what I mentioned earlier. You, you can easily switch between those uh, clusterings actually. <laughs> But for the moment, let's stay with a cleaning average. So, um, as uh, you can see here, we have some uh, we have some clusters within that heat map, and you can see that for every patient here, you have uh, well, that actually you have the dendrogram displayed, and what you can do is you can select the patients over this dendrogram, or you do it manually via those buttons. So why would you want to do that? The reason for that is pretty simple. Um, let's say we're interested in this big fat red cluster, which I selected by clicking here. Um, I want to further uh, to, to, to make some further analysis on those patients. What I could do now is and I will not do it because it will last again a moment and I don't have a lot of time with this. I could press this button, update cohorts by selection, and it will update the cohorts selection to that patients and you can uh, check, um, have a look at them at uh, different tools like you, you could launch, uh, launch uh, advanced workflows or you use other tools of mine to make further research on that patients or you export them or whatever. Well, um, I think that's it for the heat map. What I'm going to show you now is the timeline analysis. Uh, just a little word of warning that are artificial data, so they might be a bit over-optimistic. And I, maybe the labeling doesn't make so much sense, but it's just to demonstrate the functionality. Um, Just a little moment. Uh, since this data set is quite huge, I have to do a little bit of filtering. Yeah, and we're good in time. Uh, this will last a little moment, as you can see here, because um, each of those uh, data, uh, if each of those points contains uh, 200 patients, so. Uh, which is uh, quite a lot. Uh, some words what this is actually going to be. Um, let's say you have uh, several, let's say in this case 200 patients and 50 d visits. So they go 50 times to a doctor and the doctor is, um, is noting the protein level, whatever, the mRNA level and the biomark one. But that can be anything. <laughs> Uh, and it doesn't matter what he's measuring, so even if this is, let's say, if he's measuring 50 values or if he's measuring three values, it doesn't really matter since it's uh, dynamically uh, uh, created, what you will see in a moment. I'm sorry, it's, it's not going faster. It should be done in some seconds. Let's say half a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel I should have loaded that data before. Well, it's extra slow because it's a live demo. Uh, so obvious question. Uh, I 
actually, uh, it's not me deciding this. You will have to ask my, uh, I think you will have to ask Manfred and Reinhardt about this. Maybe Jay as well. It's not, yeah, it's, it's really not me deciding this. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give you more details. I, I, I actually, after this presentation, I have a little. Yeah. After this presentation, I have a little uh, slide, which uh, which will show you uh, one of my problems with uh, the release of Smarter. But first, I would like to show you this. Okay. Um, where do I start? Um, as you as you probably remember, I was dragging three different concepts here. Um, that are the three different uh, boxes you see here now. Here, Biomark 1, mRNA level, and protein level. So each of that lines represent one patient. Now, in of course, the patients are the same over the three boxes because each patient got measured three values. So um, before I start the interesting stuff, you can of course change the background. I was choosing black because it's just easier for analysis. Uh, for, 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 for for the human eye, I would say. You can smooth the data. Okay, and now let's start with the interesting stuff. You can go with your mouse in each of that boxes and hover uh, a timeline. Uh, wait, you are not supposed to see that yet. And hover a timeline. Um, you see that patient is uh, visualized, uh, is, is highlighted in all other concepts, in all other uh, Values you are measuring. Now that can be quite interesting if you want to if you want to trace uh, one of the uh, one of the measures in another concept. Um, now what you can do as well is um, ah yeah you can zoom actually what you want to see. As you can see here, all concepts we were selecting are zoomed according. Uh, according to what I select now. Yeah. Um, now, one of the big problems which uh, is that the x-axis is not always sortable. Uh, you can have, uh, for example, um, x uh, labels like, like, like uh, baseline, medication 1, visit 2, uh, day 3, third day, that it's impossible to sort. At least in at least, uh, I, I think uh, Florian was telling me that there are some plans on on implementing uh, a way of of storing that data, but for the moment there is, there is no way of actually having or proper sorting. So what you can actually do is um, you can resort the x-axis if you would like to. Of course, here the sorting is quite obvious, but it's just to demonstrate the functionality. And as you can see here, uh, the values in all concepts are automatically updated according to the sorting I was applying down there. Um, you might want to be interested in clustering that data, um, at least manually. So what you could do is, for example, do something like this. Uh, maybe I should show that before. Um, what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm selecting um, I'm, I'm selecting um, several lines. After that, I do a right click, and I cluster them, and they get assigned a color. This is basically useful. Um, let's say you see in one of the concepts that those patients definitely belong together, and now you see in another concept that um, they are somehow completely divergent. So that would be really uh, interesting uh, patients to analyze, uh, analyze in uh, another tool, for example. Uh, for the moment, I will reset it again, and I will show you this correlator graph. Um, if you go over a line and wait a moment, uh, there will be a, a request sent to the server, and it will compute you a correlator graph. Correlator graphs are basically um, measures of uh, of how random your data are. So um, the, the, the longer these uh, white bars are, 
Um, the, the, um, uh, this thing works. So let's random there basically. So you see that in the last line, in the last, in the Biomark 1 concept, there is really, really small bus which indicates that there is a lot of randomness as, uh, uh, as opposite in the protein level where they are really big, so they are not so random. It's quite interesting uh, measure of significance. Uh, so the last thing I'm going to show is the timeline clustering. For the moment, I have three different things. I have the uh, hierarchical correlation average, I have the hierarchical Euclidean average, and I have the hierarchical autocorrelation average. It's basically here for, in, for example, cor uh, correlation. It's pretty nice to discover timelines which maybe have uh, a big Euclidean distance, but which look really, really similar then they will have a big correlation. As uh, so Euclidean is just Euclidean and autocorrelation is comparing basically the correlograms with each other. So I'm, I'm just going to click it. And ah, here they are. Uh, as you see here, we have our dendrograms again, which, uh, which represent our clusters we have here. And what happens is, if you go over those nodes, you see uh, you see which patients are actually clustered within those nodes. Now, what you can do is something really similar to the manual selection. You simply click your date, uh, your your node here, and they are colored, as you can see here. Um, now, the purpose is the same then for the manual one, but this one might be from time to time uh, some more, well, preferable choice. So, and I think that's it. And I have a little bit of time, so I'm going to show the last tool which is ready to, show, to be shown, which is the correlation analysis. Um, what I'm doing now is I'm plotting uh, age against survival time, and I want uh, my uh, my uh, data points to be annotated with those node stages. Just clean up here a little bit. Just really quick, that will not last long. And here we are. Away with that legend. As you can see here, we have our two histograms for the. Uh, uh, for the y-axis and the x-axis, and we have our data points. Now, there is again, of course, uh, 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 the tooltip. We see that uh, the points are colored. That is basically, as you can see here, the nodes we were just uh, tracking here, which work with other nodes to, as well, tumor stages, metastasis stages. We have our uh, regression line here, and what you can actually do is you select a certain area, and you see that the whole thing is updated on the fly, be it, be it the regression line, uh, the values, the histogram, everything really dynamical. Now, from time to time, you might have values which you want to exclude, so you make a right click and you simply exclude those values, or you might have values that you want to zoom in, or you have values that you want to exclude, um, you can reset all of that, of course, you can change the uh, number of containers you want, and you can, and that I will show because it will not last really long to show this, update the cohorts. And as you can see here, the cohorts we're updating from within Smarter. Um, and you see, well, actually you don't see it because I was moving out while it was, well, here. Um, you see that the cohorts are updated, uh, that what's this place updated according to the code selection I made. Well, um, and if I was not forgetting anything, then that's it. Now I'm going to show uh, two last slides, then I'm done. Uh, first, some acknowledgements to my colleagues, my chef, uh, Florian and Axel from Work Package 2. They were all a great help uh, in the one or the other way of, uh, of and helping me to develop this. 
and uh, I know the last slide. Um, the challenges. Sorry. Uh, now um, the challenges in development and release. Uh, Smarter is developed against the research branch of Transmart. Um, because the stable branch contains bugs and issues that break certain features. Um, the problem with the research branch again is that uh, there is features, core features, which are uh, changing without notification, which create a lot of overhead for me because I will have to uh, fix uh, the functionality of Smarter once those features are changing. Uh, so this is the reason of delay. Um, and the last thing is that, um, well, the release of Smart R is highly dependent on how, whether or how these problems are, uh, are solved. So what would be a requirement on my side or on our side would be that uh, several developers are um, working better with each other on, uh, or coordinating better on this. Well, um, that's it from my side. Uh, yeah, it's uh, actually actually we uh, were talking about this. I'm currently in a, in a um, testing phase, uh, and I think if those problems are solved, which I was talking about, then let's say within the next two months we can expect. Uh, a version, uh, not maybe a necess necessary stable version, but a beta version of Smarter, which is probably based at that point on the research branch. So definitely sooner than later. Thanks, Thanks Ross. That was a great presentation. Um, one of the things I would suggest for you is to coordinate with uh, Terry Weymouth, who's the code community code committee fellow and is coordinating me, uh, with Terry Weymouth. Ah, okay. Yeah. So Terry is the, is the code committee fellow. Um, it's his responsibility for the foundation uh, to help coordinate what's happening with the version 1.2.5 release. Mm -hmm. uh, the 1.2.5 release, uh, I believe, is developed upon the, the master branch. I don't know if it's the same as the research branch or not. Um, but you want to make sure that um, those key fixes that you require are in that 1.2.5. And the release process for 1.2.5 will be uh, more formal than it was for 1.2.4. And so you should have a much more stable release. Uh, and you want to make sure that your features are in there. Okay. Thank you for that tip. I'm definitely going to talk to you. And I'll talk with Terry as well. Kevin, do you want to see if there's any questions? So uh, we, we've had two questions posed in the chat window. Um, actually, we now have another. Um, um, Pinal, um, I will um, I will unmute you so you can actually uh, articulate your your question for for the community. So, Pinal. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, okay, um, so we just installed Transmart 1.2, and we are struggling with the ETL processes. And Google Group is not that responsive. Is there any way we can reach out to somebody, or there is something documentation we can get help with? Absolutely. I think uh, any any issue around content, we uh, just brought on Peter Rice as our content fellow. Uh, you can get in contact with him, and he can uh, help point you to the right resources internally. Um, are you working with any service providers? I didn't notice your organization. Um, I mean, I work with UIC, um, but other than that, like we are academic institution, and we are trying to just have a prototype first and see how it works, and then probably subscribe to it and get more involved with the uh, mm -hmm. foundation. But at this point in time, we are kind of stuck, and so we posted our questions on Google Groups, and it's kind of hit and miss. Sometimes you get answers, sometimes there's nobody there, so yeah. Well, what you want to do is, is get engaged with what we have on uh, on HipChat. So we have an Atlassian infrastructure for people that are working directly on the platform. And if you contact Peter, uh, okay. Peter Rice, Peter.Rice at TransmartFoundation.org, he can help you uh, get set up. He and Terry can help you with that. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. 
ETL is certainly one of the biggest challenges on the platform. Uh, you know, getting data cleaned up, organized, curated, semantically integrated, and loaded is is one of the key the key challenges. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, AJ uh, Ja has uh, asked uh, about details uh, on today's presentation. So um, as Rudy mentioned earlier, there will be links from the Transmart Foundation website, uh, both on the presentation, but on the overall recording and, and the live demo. Um, uh, as far as installation details, I, I think that that's an unanswered uh, question at this point. Sasha, did you say earlier that um, that the SmartR uh, platform and the work that you've done is, is available um, to the community, or is that something you're working through in terms of permissions? Um, excuse me, I was not understanding what you mean by commissions. So um, is anybody in the Transmark community that has an interest in working with the SmartR uh, capabilities that you've developed out, is it possible for them to get access to the source code and, uh, okay. and to, to help, um, uh, you know, extend its capabilities? Uh, well, not for the moment. As I said, I'm not the one who's deciding when this will be available. You will have to talk with Reinhardt or Manfred and Jay about this. Right. Um, but I think that it will in the near future, as, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm currently working on, on I'm, I'm, I'm working on a version uh, for it to release within the next two months. Okay. So uh, hey, excuse me, just just one moment. Sure. So, AJ, AJ, while we're waiting for Sasha to come back, the, the foundation will follow up with, with Reinhardt and provide some, some information back to the community at large, including yourself, about uh, access to, to uh, uh, the capabilities we saw demoed today. And I'm currently working on, on, on you know, all, all, the, all the paper stuff, like, like installation details, uh, the documentation, a proper one, how to use it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, testing, of course, uh, so it will not crash once you use something else in Firefox. Uh, so all that things. But um, as I said, I think within the next two months you will hear definitively uh, from the again about this. Thank, uh, thank you, Sasha. Um, so IO Informatics and uh, Julie Bryan from Financial Biosciences um, have uh, indicated that uh, they would be interested or, or can make um, ETL um, references available uh, in, in response to your query, Pinal. So um, uh, offline, we can, we can connect you up uh, appropriately. Thank you so very much. Okay, uh, any other questions or, or comments that anybody would like to make today? So Keith, uh, let, let's provide you the opportunity to make any closing remarks and, and we'll, um, we'll put uh, or allow everybody to move on with their day. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, thanks Sasha for a, a really great demo on, uh, on an interesting project. If anyone else has interesting projects they'd like to highlight at the community call, just get in touch with, uh, with Kevin, uh, who can help you uh, uh, organize that process. But uh, again, thanks everyone. We'll see you uh, in August. Thank you, everybody.